Hello, everybody, and welcome to September. We are so excited that you're here with us today, and we're looking forward to our discussion about what does your strategy say about you engaging, attracting, and retaining your workforce. We have a great lineup of guest speakers here today with us, and we are thankful that they've taken the time to share their best practices with all of us. My name is Jessica Miller, and I'm the Director of Workforce Strategy for the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, and we are so happy to have you here with us today. If you are new here, thank you so much for joining, and if you are returning, thank you for coming back again. Uh, take a second in the chat, introduce yourselves. I see some names already out there. It just helps us build our wide network of uh, friends in this room today. Our team of consultants uh, work regionally, and if you pop to the next slide there, um, which means that each consultant will have a slightly different way of doing their work based on the region that they're supporting and the employers that they're serving in those regions. But the common core ways that we support our employers are identified here on this slide. We work with you to identify gaps in your current strategies, ensure that you're connected with your local, regional, and state workforce partners, and we assist you in building out strategies that will help you attract and retain workforce. Our consultation process is rooted and informed in data and is developed specifically with your company's needs and goals in mind. We serve as your guide through the process and convene workforce partners and for support, uh, share training grant opportunities, and continually check in to ensure that progress is being made and assist in making adjustments along the way of of your strategy implementation. When you work with us, you're automatically connected to a wide network of people and partners who work collaboratively for the success of our state, our regions, our communities, so that your business and our workforce can thrive. We do not do this work alone. It takes many people to bring success to these efforts, and a lot of them are going to be in this room with us today. Our session will go until 12 noon, after which we'll segue into our 30 minute unplugged portion of the event where we invite you to turn on your cameras, unmute yourself and ask questions of our panelists as well as our team of workforce strategy consultants, verbally or through chat, whatever your comfort level is. I would also like to take a moment to encourage you to fill out the evaluation at the end of our time here together. We will get that link popped into the chat for you um, a few times throughout the session. As always, these webinars are recorded and available to view at any time via YouTube, as well as our CareerForce MN website, where you will also find recordings and resources from this session, as well as all of our previous sessions. There's a gold mine out there. We will again be utilizing chat, uh, the chat feature throughout our time. Please ask questions, answer questions, and interact with our guests, consultants, partners, and each other. We really do want to build upon the community that we started here, and we welcome your engagement. To kick things off again, um, let us know who you are, where you work, and what you would like to learn more about today. We have a packed agenda. And we have some guests who have dedicated their careers to being change makers and culture shakers. So without further ado, it's my privilege to introduce you to our Metro-based workforce strategy consultant, Adeshewa Adesiji. Thank you so much, uh, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. My name is Adeshewa Adesiji. I am the Metro Area Workforce Strategy Consultant, and I will be facilitating today's Workforce Wednesday webinar. Uh, the topic is, what does your strategy say about you engaging, attracting, and retaining your workforce? Before I move forward, I just want to apologize. Uh, if you hear music in the background, we just realize that that is something that is I believe beyond our control, but we are trying to work on it. Hopefully we'll resolve it before the end of the um, the end of this webinar. So uh, once again, I do apologize for that. Hope that that is not um, going to become something irritating for the audience. So hopefully from uh, this, you will walk away with some helpful tips um, to start or continue your journey to grow uh, your workforce. So let's take a look at the agenda. So uh, some of the topics that I'll be covering includes uh, what is your message? Why having a good reputation is important? First impressions are important. Uh, EVP versus EVP. No, it's not a typo. I put that um, deliberately and I will go into on a later slide what both of those EVP stand for. 
uh, recruiting and retention? Are they concurrent actions or do we still treat them as two separate uh, actions? Self-sabotage, are you getting in your own way? Uh, then we'll have a panel discussion uh, and then we will close up and then we'll have our 30 minute workforce Wednesday unplugged. So let's just start out and let's say, what is your message? So, you know, establishing a good reputation is key to attracting interest from job seekers and retaining your current employees. Uh, wages, salaries, culture, et cetera, are equally as important. However, you know, no one wants to spend a majority of their time outside of home in an environment that drains versus rejuvenate your energy, no matter how much you're offering. You know, the key to developing a strong message is to develop those core points or ideas that convey to the audience that encompasses the company's values, goals, and selling points. You know, the message should resonate with your target audience, in this case, either job candidates or your current employees, and communicate its, its essence effectively. You know, your message should include points you want to hear, you want your audience to hear, I'm sorry, understand and remember. You know, your employer brand and message should be a clear and honest representation of your company's culture and values. You know, it should communicate what it's like to work at your organization, you know, what employees can expect and, you know, what you stand for as an employer. You know, this message should be relatable and resonate with your target audience. Um, you know, unfortunately, many employers never consider their messaging and how controlling their messaging or their narrative is the start of building trust and interest in your company. You know, we focus a lot of recruiting and retention efforts, you know, but how does your messaging and your reputation fit into both of those efforts? You know, when delivering a message to recruit and retain employees, you know, some of the things that we would like you to consider, you know, the EVPs, which I'll explain in a future uh, slide, you know, your employer branding, internal communication, referral, employee referral programs, training opportunities, uh, peer uh, mentorships or regular mentorships, and then just total packaging, you know, rewards, benefits, et cetera. You know, there's a lot that goes into your message and what your message should be. So, you know, what does building a strong reputation or why does building a strong reputation matter for your business? You know, the difference between a successful and a less successful business can come down to practices and actions from management and leadership. You know, your reputation can make or break a company. You know, what you see are some of the factors that can contribute to a company's reputation. You know, and some of these might be outside of your wheelhouse, depending on what your role is, is in your company. They're all equal, equally important. You know, however, there are some that can be molded and developed by those in this audience, such as, you know, your vision and leadership, emotional appeal, workplace environment, you know, just to name a few. You know, one that's not mentioned is, you know, the lowering of turno turnovers. Companies with strong employer reputations tend to have higher employee satisfaction and lower turnover rates. So, you know, what are the benefits of having a good reputation? Well, here's a few. And of course, we couldn't list them all because we don't have hours. Um, I only have a short period of time with you guys. So here are a few. You know, having a good reputation, it increases trust from your employees. Um, it attracts better and more skilled talent. Um, establishing, it helps you to establish a reputation authority, you know, within your industry or your size of business, it, you know, you're able to establish that, that authority or stand out from the crowd, as you say. Um, increasing website and other social media views. People that are interested, or if you have a good reputation and people know about it, they're going to be very interested and they're going to want to go to your website to see what you're about. And you just attract more customers. It doesn't matter if you're a B2B customer or a B2C or a B2B employer or a B2C employer, you're going to be able to attract more customers because you have a positive repu uh, reputation. So how can you as an employer build or add on to your good reputation? You know, maintaining a good reputation is always a work in progress. It's never a one and done. And I think that that is um, something that a lot of employers think is that once you build that reputation, then you don't have to worry about maintaining it. You must always maintain and work on keeping your good reputation. So, you know, here are a few, a few ways of building or starting to build or build a strong reputation for your company. You know, identify and promote what makes your company unique and a great place to work. 
You, uh, monitor public information about your company. Once again, making sure that uh, information about your company and social media are positive. Uh, routinely checking um, different websites that allow people to give um, um, feedback and ratings on your company. Uh, create a positive work environment. Become the company candidates want to work for and employees would like to stay at. Uh, building trust and uh, that will help build that loyalty. Show appreciation through recognition and rewarding employees. Um, get your employees involved. You know, candidates trust employees more than they trust management leadership or employers or owners. So try to get your employees involved or get your, yeah, get your employees involved as much as possible in the uh, recruiting and retention process. You know, articulate your values to help guide the recruitment process and employee experience. And then just in the end, just be a good or great employer. Treat your employees well. That is always going to be a sure win with building and maintaining your reputation. In the end, just be a good employer. So for uh, those, I will say, more seasoned audience members, <laughs> um, do you remember the head and shoulders commercials of the 80s and 90s? I think a lot of you do. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to have you guys uh, raise your hand. No one has to let us know how old you are. But their tagline was, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So for you millennials and Gen Z, yes, there were commercials of 80s and 90s, and that was their tagline. Uh, so making a, a good first impression can determine a candidate's continuous interest in you as a potential employer. You know, it usually starts when your candidate encounters your job advertisement, explores your website, or engages with your social media presence. Uh, research done by Robert Half UK found that over half, so 53% of people make up their minds about a new job before their first interview has even finished, and almost a quarter of job hunters, or 24%, decide whether it's for them within, five, within the first five minutes of their first meeting. You know, your hiring process creates the candidate's first impression. So here are some things that employers should consider when making a first impression, uh, especially for candidates. Keep in contact with candidates during the entire process. Um, as a workforce strategy consultant, I tell employers all the time, make sure that you keep your candidates informed, engaged, transparency is very important. Candidates shouldn't be the only ones preparing for the interview. I'm sure all of us has been on the other end where we had interviewed for a job and the person that was interviewing us was totally not prepared or nonchalant and really felt like that they didn't care. And we left that, that, that interview just with a different impression and a different opinion of that employer. And I'm sure some of us probably thought to ourselves, do we really want to work for that employer if they didn't even take the time to be prepared to interview us? Uh, a candidate's time is valuable. Never keep them waiting. I think a lot of times employers, not a lot of employers, but some employers would think that if someone, someone who is interviewing and want to work for their company is desperate, to work for the company. And so they don't really need to take into consideration that candidate's time preparing for that candidate. Well, that's totally wrong. A candidate's time is just as valuable as yours. So never keep them waiting and always making sure that you're fully prepared. Spend at least 30 minutes with each candidate. Once again, this is not a assembly line where it's 15 minutes. Okay, we interviewed you, now you can leave. Really get to know the candidate. Let that candidate know that you want to know about them. You want to know about outside of, you know, the reasons or the, why they want to work for your company. Maybe small chit chat about family, about life. Really, you know, just let them know that you are taking their interview with you seriously. Don't talk down to your candidates. Once again, having that mindset that that candidate you know, wants to work for your company and they're willing to do anything for your company and they're, or to work for your company and they're willing to accept any type of attitude or conversations that you give to them. No, do not talk down to your candidates. Once again, your candidate's time is valuable. Listen twice as much as you speak. There's a saying that I always like to use and is we have two, mo uh, two ears, two eyes, and one mouth for a reason. We need to observe and listen more than we talk. So listen twice as much as you speak. Get to know that candidate. 
provide prompt interview feedback as soon as you can. Was it good? Was it bad? You know, what are the next steps in the process? And then focus on the people, not the paperwork. People are people. They are not, um, you know, confined or, or just a name or a number on a piece of paper, but there are their people. So focus on the people and not the paperwork. So, you know, we can't talk about messages, company reputations, um, or first impressions without addressing or talking about how the multi-generational workforce fits in, into all of this. So, you know, as we know, there are currently five generations in the workplace, soon to be six. So Generation Alpha is now uh, at that age where they are um, able to work like summer youth jobs, you know, those kind of things. So they're slowly getting into the workforce. You know, each generation brings vastly different experiences and knowledges to the workplace, giving companies with successful multi-generational teams a powerful advantage. You know, a cohesive multi-generational multi workforce requires understanding the diverse motivations and needs of each generation. You know, each generation will directly or indirectly provide input that employers can use to build a strong company uh, reputation. So, you know, as the workforce continues to change, employers must remain alert and responsive to ensure they attract and retain the best talent from every generation. You know, companies must realize each generation is driven by different motivators, goals, expectations, therefore creating a strong company reputation that appeals to all age groups is both important and at the same time could be a challenge for employers, unfortunately. You know, a successful talent attraction and retention strategy in a multi-generational workplace requires, you know, a nuanced approach that appreciates the differences and similarities across generations. So if you look at this chart, you'll see, um, you know, the different, the five generations current in the workplace. We still have some from the silent generation. We still have baby boomers, uh, of course, Generation X, millennials, and Generation Z. So really, I want you to focus on the values of each of those generations. So for example, if you look at the silent generation and baby boomers, they have loyalty. So is your reputation in your company, is it saying that you're one of loyalty? You're loyal to your um, to your employees. You know, although the silent generation, baby boomers, are starting to phase out and starting to retire, you know, those that are still working, if they're working for a company whose reputation is built on loyalty and just that respect they're going to want to stay as long as they possibly can. They're not going to want to leave early. So, you know, for that generation, they're looking at loyalty. For Generation X, we're looking at monetary awards. So bonuses, money like that. Does your company reputation, is it one where you have bonuses or, or you properly reward people for their work? If you look at millennials, um, it is, you know, growth, uh, you know, growth in, in the workplace. So is your company reputation one where you promote uh, career advancement, career development, career growth? You know, that might be something that you, you will be able to attract uh, more millennials. And then for Gen Z, diversity. You know, a lot of Gen Z want to work for companies that uh, promote and have a reputation for diversity and giving everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, size, religious beliefs, what have you, the same opportunities. Are you a company that has a reputation for positive, for promoting diversity and having a diverse uh, work environment? So those are some of the things that, you know, employers, when um, building a reputation, de uh, de developing their message. Um, when they're thinking about uh, generational differences, those are some of the things to really consider to attract uh, candidates and um, retain those employees from all generations. I think we also have to look at just migration and look at um, uh, workers um, from other countries that are now um, residents, um, immigrants, new Americans in the United States. Um, I know that the climate currently, um, you know, there are some that are not really supportive of, of immigrants, new Americans coming into um, the United States, but um, I say that is equally as important for employers to make sure that they build a reputation um, 
and they deliver a positive message to these communities as well uh, because they're here to stay. So if you look at the chart that I have on your screen, and if you look at the red circle, the net migration, now this is from uh, 2022. So if they're more likely are, is some updated information out there, but I think the message is still the same. If you look at either the Twin Cities metro area or Minnesota, it shows that the majority of net migration was international. What that means is that there are a lot more individuals from other countries migrating uh, to both the Twin Cities metro area in Minnesota uh, than domestic. And so, um, the for, foreign born population in the metro is, is growing rapidly. So between 2010 and 2022, this population expanded in the region by 29.3% or about 86,000 people. Now, a significant of share of these foreign born populations in the metro area falls in what we call prime working years. So that's between the ages of 25 and 54. So that's also across multiple generations as well. Um, so this share is 61.9% compared to the 49, 40.9% 40 for uh, the total population. So in other words, the high share, a high share of foreign born population in the region is at an age where they are ready, willing and able to work. So in addition of looking at building a reputation across different generations, also how to build a reputation um, and a message um, for individuals, foreign born individuals who are working age um, to work here in the Twin Cities or in, the, in Minnesota, how to develop a message to attract those individuals as well. It's just as important. All right, so now we're at EVP versus EVP. I know you guys could not wait <laughs> to find out what this means. So uh, EVP, EVP stands for both employer value proposition and employee value proposition. So an employer value proposition or sometimes considered an employer brand refers to your company's core benefits that make up your wider employer brand. So consider it as you know, an understanding between an employer and a potential applicant. It defines what your company and culture can offer them in exchange for their talent, skills, and experience. Uh, employers can use an EVP to build a case for why top talent should choose their business. Now, an employee value proposition is defined as a statement of values, rewards, recognition, support, and company culture that an employer gives employees, enabling them to do their best work and achieve their, their highest potential. Overall, an EVP describes the mix of characteristics, benefits, and ways of working in an organization. And so if you look at, you know, looking at what your talent wants versus what your company wants, the EVP is kind of a mixture uh, in, the, in the middle. So once again, um, a good way to build your reputation, a good way to deliver a positive message, to really attract and retain those candidates employee, and employees is to have a good EVP. Um, so developing a strong EVP is an important factor in a company's recruiting and retention efforts. Um, it can represent everything of value uh, an employer provides to the employees. Um, Avoid focusing on leadership and not the employee when developing an EVP. Uh, it's important to focus on the employees when developing that. Um, having a good EVP does contribute to decreasing employee turnover. And it also contributes to having a greater employee engagement within the company. So um, I believe there's a couple of resources um, that will be available after this, which talks more about EVP. If you are not familiar with EVP during my research to put this together, this is something that I learned. I would highly suggest that you um, look more into EVP. And if you think that there's something that your company can benefit from, definitely talk to leadership about um, starting that, that journey and getting something uh, established to recruit and retain uh, top talent. All right. So does recruiting and retention overlap? So, th so this is this is something that I have thought about for a while um, in my work as a workforce strategy consultant. 
And yes, I think that there is a close um, link between recruiting and retention. So in the beginning, I used to look at recruiting as the first step and then retention as the second step. So once you got them, how do you keep them? That's when the retention goes into play. Um, I think looking now, you know, just with the work that I have done um, and the employers that I've worked with, I think that they should be considered overlapping and together and part of a, a company strategy. So, um, like I said, most of us consider recruiting and retention as two separate strategies, you know, where one ends, the other begins. However, it should be considered that retention starts immediately re recruiting. So, for example, uh, with recruiting, you are trying to attract that uh, candidate's attention. So once you have attracted that candidate's attention, that's where the retention starts because you want to continue to retain that talent's attention. So retention doesn't start when that candidate becomes an actual employer employee. It starts once you know that they are interested in working for your company, how to retain and keep that interest. So. Uh, yeah, once again, once you get the attention of the candidate showing interest in your positions, the goal should be retaining that interest. Um, a candidate's retention goal uh, is assuring or the retention goal is ensuring that the candidates continue retention. And well, you want to make sure let me let me rephrase this. You know, the goal of the employer is to overall make sure that that candidate remains engaged and interested throughout the entire process. So, yes. I think that it for employers that haven't considered this before, um, moving forward, look at, instead of looking at recruiting and retention as two separate um, strategies, that recruiting and retention overlap and go together and retention actually starts as soon as you get that candidate's attention, you wanna retain their attention through the process. So can employees sabotage their recruiting and retention plans? So unfortunately, the answer is yes. Um, I have seen it, unfortunately, with some of the employers that I have worked with. Um, you know, employers can sabotage their recruiting strategies in several ways, you know, including poor communication, relying too much on interviews, and usually unconscious bias. So what I have is just a sum of the ways that employers can possibly self-sabotage their recruiting efforts and therefore uh, hurting their message, their reputation, and all of that. So uh, vague or misleading job descriptions. So the post and pray method, you just post anything and just pray that people will find it and come to you. Uh, frustrating application processes, uh, poorly managed web presence, Poor preparation, once again, not being prepared for a candidate's interview. Um, unstructured interviews, um, poor communication, lack of accountability on the, the account uh, of the point of the employer. Um, separating your HR and recruiter or not separating your HR recruiter. So there's been a lot of uh, research and a lot of articles that I have found, which says that, you know, sometimes it's important to separate um, the HR and the recruiter. Uh, as they say, all recruiters are inherently human resource professionals, but not all human resource professionals are recruiters. So making sure that you separate, uh, sometimes separate those two. Um, and then not focusing on um, trainable talent. You know, um, the rule of thumb that I'd like to, to give to employers is, you know, instead of requiring that someone has at least 80% of the qualifications that you're looking for um, in order to be a, a qualified candidate. If they have 60 or 70, are they able to be taught to get up to that 80 or more percent that you're looking for? So not focusing on trainable talent and just expecting everyone to have all of those skill sets and be ready to go um, during the candidate process is a way that employers can sabotage their recruiting and really miss out on some good people. So here's a few ways that employers can sabotage their retention uh, efforts. Um, not establishing a culture where education is encouraged and rewarded. Uh, dismissing employee concerns. 
not addressing workforce gossip and rumor spreading, uh, lack of transparency or withholding information from employees, uh, talking behind backs, gossip. I mean, yes, there are unfortunately managers and leadership that will um, participate in that. Uh, employers providing a non-safe work environment, uh, ignoring disengaged employees. And then last but not least, uh, employee burnout. So those are, are not addressing the employee burnout. So those are some ways that um, employers can uh, sabotage their retention efforts as well. So with that, we have come to the most important part of this webinar is the uh, panel discussion. So before we get into that, and I stop sharing and hopefully the music, if you still hear it, will go away. Um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the two panelists. So first we have uh, Brianne Pringle, who is presently the Director of Human Resources at Helene. I think I pronounced that right. Helene is located in the Iron Range and manufactures solar panels. Uh, Brianne is located in Saul, in Saul State Marie, Ontario, Canada, I believe. Is that correct? Okay, and oversees human resources for both Canada and the US. Uh, she has over 15 years of HR experience. 10 of those years are in leadership roles. So as a leader in human resources, she could commit, uh, her commitment extends beyond routine tasks to foster an environment where mental health and exclusivity are paramount. She has worked diligently to create a supportive and safe atmosphere, providing positive change and ensuring that every member feels valued. Very important. With a strong foundation in time management, analytical skills, and critical thinking, she has effectively managed diverse HR facets, including recruitment, stra uh, strategic HR, training, payroll, labor relations, wellness engagement, benefits, health and safety, payroll, internal communications, and employee relations. Her leadership is guided by the principles of truth, love, respect, wisdom, humility, brave, bravery, and honesty, the seven grandfather teachings, which resonate through her professional journey. She was a recipient of the 2024 Merit Awards, uh, Gold in HR Leadership, and Silver in Excellence in Recruiting Strategy, and the 2022 Business Administration Award for Strive Young Professionals. She is also a member of the Minnesota Indigenous Workforce Initiative through DEED and is a board member of the Algoma Workforce Investment Corporation or AWIC in Salt St. Marie. So welcome, Brianne. I hope I did uh, your introduction justice. Next, we have uh, Dina Simon, uh, Simon, who is founder and CEO of Simon Says Lead. It's a boutique professional services firm dedicated to helping individuals and organizations achieve their growth goals. Uh, before finding, founding Simon Says Lead, Dina accumulated 20 years of experience in the staffing industry. She began her journey as a recruiter and grew her career to vice president overseeing 20 or 200 franchise locations and managing over 500 million in revenue. During this journey, she managed talent acquisition programs for Fortune 100 giants, such as PepsiCo, Frito-Lay, Apple, Hewlett-Packard, and Amazon. With a strong passion for finding the right talent and addressing how companies can develop and retain that talent, she became obsessed with growing leaders and their capabilities to lead and inspire teams. Dina is certified in numerous leadership coaching and change manager programs through the Ken Blanchard Companies. She maintains her affiliation with Blanchard as a channel partner to provide Simon Says lead clients with the trainings offered. She's certified in DISC and the five behaviors. Uh, she is an authorized partner with the ability to use these assessments and training designs. Uh, and an ideal client is an individual team or company interested in growing professionally, personally and professional, professionally to achieve their goals. She is known for her unstoppable spirit and desire to make a difference in the world. So she is also an author of Make Unstoppable Simple, Creating Problem Solving and Life in Leadership, which is featured in the C-Suite Book Club. And she is one of the original members of the Thought Leader Council and is excited to return to the amazing group of talented people. So, Brianne, Dina, 
thank you so much for being a part of this panel discussion. So I will stop the presentation and hopefully the music. And we will get to the questions. So how are you ladies doing today? Great. Excellent. Good. Good. All right, so I like to just start out with a question uh, for both of you uh, to answer. So um, having, you know, we talked about having a message. So having a message and establishing a good reputation is important. It helps with, excuse me, building trust and interest in your company. For those who haven't yet defined their message or haven't considered the benefits of having a good reputation, what are some, you know, quick wins employers can do to start that process? Because we know, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but what are some of those quick wins and things that they can start uh, on that journey to um, develop a strong message and a good reputation? So, um, Brian and Dina, I will let you guys go ahead and uh, answer. Brian, you want to go, go ahead, first? Dina? Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're just too polite. Um, sure, I can go first. So um, it's interesting because I joined Helene about a year and a half ago. And um, one of the first things I did was actually meet with Deed. And uh, I think it actually really helped establish how to move us forward. And I remember the first meeting we had with Shayla, she was like, Brianne, there's not even a sign outside. And I was like, well, that's a problem because how does, uh, we're new to, we, we had been there for since 2018, but really the growth had started in 2022. And we were like, if there's no sign, how do people even know who we are? I will add, there's still no sign, um, but we do get walk-ins uh, dropping resumes off uh, on a regular basis. So the, the no sign thing is okay. Um, but what we, what we started to do was understand what was going on in that market. So we met with Deed, we found out like, hey, unemployment's actually pretty low in this area. Um, you know, what's our what's the salary? So like, are we are we even competitive in the market for our, our, our base salary? So we found out, yes, we were, we were in the right range, above the range by $7 in some places on average on salary. So we were like, well, the, the salary's not enough. So what are, what are we doing? Because at that point we were spending, agency now. So we had to figure out how to uh, attract people. And one of the other first meetings I ever had was with our marketing firm who was in New York. And I said, where's our Facebook page? And they were like, you don't need a Facebook page. And I was like, um, I'm in Ontario, Northern Ontario, and I'm in Northern Minnesota. I absolutely need a Facebook page. I was like, people aren't using Twitter. They're not using Snapchat. They need Facebook. Uh, it took me four months to convince this marketing firm to get me a Facebook page. Uh, and it is a huge traffic driver. When we post jobs on Facebook, that's how we get applicants. Um, so it's just, it's first of all, knowing your market. It's second of all, being standing up for what you know is right. So it was me pushing against the big, you know, the big wins in New York to say, no, you're wrong. I need a Facebook page. Um, and it's also about um, utilizing resources in the community and understanding that community. So, like, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm an expert in Minnesota. I'm not from Minnesota. Um, but I, I have employees who are in Minnesota. I have employees who are actively engaged in the community. And we knew, like, use your local newspapers. If bulletin boards at, at the local grocery store is how you can get your name out there, utilize them like go back to the basics um and the other big thing for us was listen to employees so we started really encouraging employees to utilize the employee suggestion box to hear what they needed or wanted um we you know if you said to me today what's your employee brand i don't i don't have one yet um we're such a, a new company that we're still developing all of those things but we took those very basic things to move us into that right direction to get us the employees in place. And, you know, we're still working daily on, on retaining those folks and, and bringing new people in. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Love all of that and, and totally echo. So I think um, being aware of an online presence, so whether you have one or not, um, being aware of it because people are, are looking at it and making those informed decisions um, you know, 
whenever they're online uh, and we don't even know when they're online. So just being aware of that presence. Um, and even with that, like I have clients that I work with that don't even realize that they have a glass door or a Google, you know, that there's things out there. Um, so knowing what's out there and being aware of it. And then some easy wins is getting to some good testimonials and good reviews. Um, that's a way to get some of those easy wins to start building back up your reputation if you're not sure what that reputation out in the community is. Um, so I think everything that you said, I totally agree with. And then and the big piece that you talked about was marketing. Like so often we forget this is a marketing, it's a brand initiative. And so the marketing department, whomever is involved in marketing really needs to be engaged in that because it is getting the message out to all of the different ways that we get those messages out. Thank you. And, I, and so Brian, I wanted to piggyback. Um, you had mentioned um, that um, when you were um, trying to establish a website, um, or was it, fa it was Facebook. No, it was, yeah, Facebook, it was, yeah. It was Facebook that leadership basically, or, or this, uh, consult, this firm that you were talking to basically said, well, in so many words, they didn't think that that was the right route to go. Um, what should someone do? You know, sometimes recognizing the need to revamp or build a message or reputation or brand in that case is not always something that leadership like figures out first. Sometimes it's usually the boots on the ground. So it's the HR, it's the talent acquisition, it might be even the employees. How should someone, you know, when if they approach me, if they approach leadership with this and get pushback, like what are some ways that they should kind of push back on the pushback. Like what would be some of those talking points that you would, because I'm sure in the audience, there are probably people that said, yes, I know that my company needs to revamp their messaging. I know my company needs to really work on their reputation, but it's falling on deaf ears. So I, for both you, Brianna and Dina, what are some of those pushback that people should have against the pushback from leadership in that case? Yeah, yeah you can you can answer yeah, first this time, yeah. So, I mean, even if you look at the slide that you presented about the different generations in the workforce, like we, all of those different generations are also receiving information differently. So the big piece is, um, you know, at least getting a chance to try something different. So if we don't, like in this example, if we didn't have Facebook before, what's the harm in getting it up and running to see the impact that it can make and then measure it because it is going to reach an audience. Um, the testimonial to say that you had all of these employees through a staffing service coming from staffing, I know the value of that, um, to now being all in-house, like that's a huge major your shift within an organization to do that and so so much of that is you got to the people that you needed to get the messaging to um and if facebook was a, a component of that i mean there's got to be great metrics to show that you were able to connect with the people that you needed to reach yeah agreed metrics is huge um so when i had first walked in the door i was coming from post-secondary i was coming from a uh, public sector because before that i was in another public sector area this was my first time in manufacturing um to be honest with you this was my first time in a very male dominated environment as well i am the uh only female senior person in in the entire organization um, so I knew when I walked in the door, like I said in, in my interview, I said, listen, I'm not going to change who I am and I'm not a yes ma'am person. So don't expect me to come in here and smile and nod and just continue to do what you've been doing because I'm not going to be okay with that. Go find somebody else. So for me personally, it's about, you know, staying true to who you are, um, having a voice in the room, um, making sure that you have a voice for people who may not feel comfortable having a voice. Um, and and really, if you have the data, present it. So one of the things that I introduced was business cases. Because before, people were just going and spending money. And they're like, oh, well, this is what we should do. And they're like, oh, okay, here's 20 grand, go do it. And then it just failed miserably or fizzled out. And so what I did, um, particularly for Facebook and LinkedIn, learn, uh, LinkedIn, was I went through and I said, I want to know how much money you spent on recruitment firms, temp, temp agencies, and advertising via LinkedIn, not with a subscription. And in six months, $300,000 was spent 
uh, advertising single-handedly with LinkedIn, not through a LinkedIn subscription, using the temp agencies and using recruitment firms. And I was like, I can get $30,000 through LinkedIn. Facebook is free. And I, and I already had, I, they had had me, I had hired staff. So I was like, and I have the staff to do this work. So I, I can save you. You already had that staff. Plus you were spending the $300,000. So money talks when it comes to executives and data talks. So putting in a business case sometimes really helps build that foundation, especially if you're someone that's not comfortable having the conversation, but you're really good with words, put it into a business case and say, this is what I need. This is why I need it. And this is why you need it. And this is what I need you to approve. And if you're scared, Hey, that's too big, break it down. Say, you know, for the first quarter, I need this for the, for the second quarter, I need that. Um, and it's, it's helped me. I'm very fortunate. I work for a company that really does let me do what I need to do and they support me, which is absolutely amazing. Um, but I'm not scared to tell them I don't agree with them. And I don't think anyone should be scared. If you are, then you're not in the right space. Okay. I like that. Like, I think we're done. We're done with the webinar. Okay. Thank you, ladies. No, I'm just joking. Um, so, uh, Brian, I'm, I'm, I'm going to switch over to you and ask you a, a specific question. Now, you had mentioned that um, your company doesn't have an employer brand yet. You're still trying to figure that out. But, I, you know, I, I, I think I want to maybe beg to differ and, and, and hear me out. Um, I, I've, in my conversations with my counterpart, Shayla um, Drake, um, there's just been a lot of good things said about your company and, and, you know, your company has gone from basically being like an unknown employer in that area to an employer of choice in the area. And you had mentioned that, you know, um, you had made a decision to understand and tap into, you know, that community, what, um, who the, are the residents, what are their concerns, you know, what they're looking for, you know, how to to become like that employer of choice for those residents. Um, so I think in a way that you, you might not have a full brand, but I think that you have more of a brand than you think. That's just my opinion. So I'll just... Sit, say that that's my opinion, but you know, um, um, tapping into the community, you know, reaching out to the community, um, as I like to say, you know, opening those doors, walking outside the four walls of your building to really get to know the community. How did taking this approach help with developing um, your company's relationship with those residents? Because once again, you know, those residents are going to become possibly become candidates who will possibly become actual employees at the company. So how did that approach help? Because that's something that we always tell employers, you know, really getting outside of your building and actually going into the community and making your presence known, let people see in your face that there are actually people within those those companies um, that are willing to engage and work with them. But so how did that approach um help in developing your relationships with those residences or those residences. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think what's important in all of it is, is knowing what works in the community that you're in. So what works for, for me in Mountain Iron, Hibbing, Chisholm, Virginia may not work for you in, in, in Minneapolis. So for us, it was, you know, how do people hear so in small communities, and I grew up in small communities across Northern Ontario. So like this is this was my bread and butter in small community life um, and grew up in mills in my town, in mine town. So like I, I know the folks in, in northern Minnesota because it's what I grew up with in, in northern Ontario. And word of mouth is how information travels in those communities. So we had to find the best ways to have word of mouth because, you know, as Shayla pointed out, we don't have a sign. So we don't even have like that basic, like, hey, here we are, we have a sign. At least that name starts to come up. And even the name Helene, so I say Helene, some people see Helene, some people say Helene, um, some pe people say Hellion. Um, and, and if you listen to Martine, our president speak, he says there's no, there's there's no um, right way to say it because it's a made up name. Um, so even that alone makes it hard to have a brand because we, we don't even say the company name in the same way. 
So what we did was, you know, where are people going to get the information? So Facebook was huge. Um, we actually literally just went and created lawn signs and said like, $21 an hour we are hiring. Um, we put posters up at, at the grocery markets. We use the local newspaper because if we're using the local newspaper, that means we're putting money back into the community. Um, we did use the Star Tribune as well because the Star Tribune gives us gives us things that others can't. Um, but I didn't go to the New York Times to try to advertise in Minnesota. I went to the Star Tribune. So it's making sure that you're utilizing the resources that are available within that community. Um, we did a career fair, and I think Shayla said this is one of the most successful career fairs that she had ever seen. We had over 100 people walk in the door, and we hired 50 people on the spot. We did on-the-spot interviews. We did it for a full day. We were a well oiled machine but we wouldn't have had a hundred people walk through that door if we hadn't been able to get out into the community with that information we've also made our business very accessible so we have done uh, tours to uh, local colleges, local public schools. Uh, we did an event um, with uh, with a green energy group last fall. Um, our executive team is constantly out networking um, with folks and bringing people in and we've built a really good relationship with deed uh because and and that helps us because here we are out of workforce wednesday talking about our company allowing us to talk about our building brand um that we wouldn't have been able to do if we didn't establish that relationship so it's really just recognizing what resources are available understanding the community that you're in and you know we're moving into um Minneapolis, um, hopefully next spring. Um, so I have to do it all over again because it's not going to be the same. <laughs> that ramp up that I did in, in Mountain Iron is definitely not going to be the same for them. Well, definitely when you, uh, when Helene uh, moves into the metro area, let me know. I will be more than happy to assist and work with Shayla <laughs> as well. So thank you. Um, so, so Dina, going back to my example of the head and shoulders, like let's just admit we were we we belong in that seasoned part of the seasoned audience, <laughs> and that uh, you know that saying of you know you never get a second chance to make a first impression. You know, as uh, someone that works with employers, I'm assuming of all sizes across all industries. Um, what what strategies? you know, without saying names, has there been strategies that employers implemented that led to just a negative first impression? Like what have been some things that employers have done that made you say, oh, ooh, yeah, this is not good. Just example. Well, yeah, I mean, so I think you talked a lot about them in what not to do. So the, it, it, the hiring practice. So how hard is it to get into an interview? And then is the people that are interviewing me, are they prepared? Was it a bad experience? Does nobody follow up? Like all those little things, they add up to a negative first impression. Um, and so when you ask the question, I love the head and shoulders, I absolutely am of that generation. Um, so often you're making that first impression every day, all day long, and you don't even know that you're making the first impression because you don't know who's looking, right? Um, so it goes back to also having a really strong EVP that you talked about. If you have, if your company understands, um, and I agree with the pushback for Brienne, you have an employer brand, even if you don't think you do because of all these amazing things that you've talked about. Um, but also then again, the flexibility to take it from one market to another market and, and ebb and flow based on what does that geography need, I think is important. But I think going back to that value proposition, so if I am a business owner or senior leadership team, if we can be really comfortable and confident in what that EVP is, and then find a way to attract the talent that like that slide was great because the in the middle is what matters the most is as long as there's enough in common um that you guys have that from an employer perspective and an employee perspective just that's where the magic is um you're not going to be all things to everybody right and so you're not gonna some people are just not going to want to work for you and not going to think that you have a great first impression and that's okay too as long as you're really confident as to here's what our values are here's what the value proposition to our employees are to our community our community engagement involvement 
Um, you know, and, and you may have somebody who says, well, I don't like the company because they're not involved in the right things that I would want my company to be involved in in the community. And that just goes back to you're not going to please everybody, but just being really grounded in who we are, why we're in this community, the things that we're doing in this community. And I think being really proud of that um, is a piece of that message as well. And then just again, you're always making that first impression. So showing up online, knowing how how your employees are showing up, um, you know, everything. So Brianne, as you talked about the executives and people that are out in the community engaged in things, people are watching. So those are those are ways to build that first impression. Um, if you have somebody out behaving badly in the community, even if it's after hours. Um, that's part of your brand reputation and first impression. Um, people are watching. Um, you know, we have a lot of employee or a lot of companies that have, you know, local brands out running around. And if somebody's wearing your logo brand and work for the company, um, even after hours, that's a first impression, how people are behaving. So those are some things that I've seen happen with uh, companies that I've been working with. Great. Thank you. So just one more question and then we'll do a... a last minute words and then we'll go into our unplugged so um let's just stay on the subject of, of evp because you had mentioned it and so i think you kind of answered this but it's some of the question but i'll say it anyway you know both evps and both evps are important so for example you know if you look at nike's evp it's we lead we invent we deliver uh, a, a, uh airbnb's EVP is create a world where anyone can belong anywhere. Uh, what should employers consider in order to have a strong EVP statement? And then how can employers tell if they're living up to those values of their EVP? So what are some of those, those other metrics? Or if you want to repeat, you know, just some of those metrics that employers um, should look at to determine if they're they're living up to their EVP. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and that's a question for both of you. Brian, you want to start? Um, sure. So this is where I say, hey, we don't we don't have that right now. So we don't actually, as a company at this moment, have a mission, vision, value. So this is, it's timely for me to be a part of this conversation where I'm like, hey, I am not someone that should be speaking on this because we don't <laughs> have it. Um, but I think what's important is you've got to found you, you still have to find those core foundations of a company, right? So you know, we want to be fair, we want to be consistent, we want to be, we want to have strong communication, we want to have mutual respect, we want to ensure that we're holding up to our standards and practices. So you need to take, you know, what those basic foundation things are, and understand what's going to drive people to work. And you can have mission, vision, values, EVPs, and if you're not holding yourself accountable to those, then they are useless. They are just words on a piece of paper and they don't matter. Um, you know, I worked for a company, it was the very first company I ever worked for. And we literally had on the background of our computer, we had our company mission. And and then I the other I went to another company and they did that. And then the the university I was at before, we never did that. And I kept going. And I worked at a, it was in a university that that was an old residential school. So we had a lot of indigenous focus. We had a special mission. We had all of this stuff. And I said, that should be in our faces every day. We need a reminder every day on why we are here. So if you're going to create that, if you want that there, it needs to be in everything that you do. So it, it needs, you can't just throw some words on, on a piece of paper and say, this is what it is. And that's why I say we don't have one yet because we need to be prepared to live up to that standard every day. And it needs to be entwined in everything you do from recruitment to retention, to even how you exit an employee out the door. It all needs to be entwined in what you do. Yeah, to I totally agree. So if you're gonna have it, it needs to be visible like you talked about, but not just on a wall there. And it's how is it being lived out? What are the stories that every day somebody could point back to the values um, and me and measure it? How do you hire for it? How do you fire for it? Just everything you talked about. So I actually think it's, it would be, a re this is a really fun case study because if you feel that that's not fully documented right now for your organization, 
Um, but all the people that you like, all the positive things that you just talked about, it would be really fun to, as you flesh out, what are the top five that, you know, core values or whatever, based on it being a living, breathing organism that has, doesn't feel there's word on paper right now. It'd be really interesting to see what you end up coming up with down the line, if you actually put it on paper. Um, but you pro you may have an even stronger um evp right now because it's not written out it's just truly organically what's being lived out within the company culture i think it's really fascinating so agree if you're going to have it if you're going to take the time to write it out and have a vision mission values and all of that um you know if you could walk around and ask any one employee within the company what are what is the vision or mission statement of the company and if they look at you like a deer in the headlights it's not it's not worth even going through the exercise. So that's, you know, at the end of the day, it's how is it measured? How is it being lived out um, truly within the organization? All right, thank you so much. Now, if really quick in like 30 seconds, any last minute words, advice for people in the audience? Honestly, I think the biggest thing, and you said it and it was, um, it was an, an indigenous um, colleague of mine who who said, you know, creator gave us two ears, two eyes and one mouth. And I, that's really s stuck with me. So the biggest advice I can give is listen, uh, because if, if you are not if you are just sitting there in your ivory tower or whatever we want to call it, making the decisions and have no idea what's going down on the ground, it's never going to be successful. And once the decisions are made, it's top down and it's bottom up. It can't just be like everybody has to be a part of it. So, yeah, I I would totally agree. So, um, not only listen but ask. So, ask for feedback from all the different stakeholders, and then really actively listen, um, and gain that knowledge, and then figure out what to do with it from cascading messaging and and how to make improvements. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, so just for the recap, really strong, uh, quick recap, having a strong message will make you stand out. Uh, bad news travels faster than good news, so make sure your reputation is positive. Values can differ with different ge generations. Strong EVPs can equal success for employers. Retention during the can retention starts during the candidate process and not after official hire. Sometimes employers unfortunately can be their own worst enemy and resources are available to assist you in your journey to becoming an employer champion, aka the workforce strategy consultants. So on that note, I want to say Brianne, Dina, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful panel discussion. I will pass this along to my counterpart, Della Ludwig, who is going to talk about the wonderful topic for next month. So take it away, Della. Awesome. Thank you so much. And again, thank you, Adajewa, Dina, and Brianne. You guys did an awesome job. It was very informative. I'm Della Ludwig. I am Central Minnesota's Workforce Strategy Consultant and um, can't wait to dive into our unplugged session, which is gonna be uh, your opportunity as attendees to ask questions directly to the panel. Um, first, we just wanna go through a couple announcements. Um, please take a quick moment uh, to complete the survey on today's presentation and let us know what discussions you also want to hear from 2025 as we begin to um, work out next year's Workforce Wednesdays planning. Uh, and then next month on October 2nd on Workforce Wednesday, our topic will be on building your own future workforce, training and upskilling your workforce for tomorrow's needs. Uh, this will be focused on deeds, training grants, including the partnership grant, uh, job training incentive program, which we call JTIP, and the automation training incentive program, which is known as ATIP. Uh, hear from our MJSP team and a diverse panel of employers and subject matter experts and on how these grants have been used to enhance and strengthen their workforce. Uh, please join prepared to share your successes and experiences as well as ideas. October's Workforce Wednesday registration is now open, so please feel free to sign up today. You can also go to careerforcemn.com slash workforce Wednesday 
to check out our past and upcoming session topics, resources, blogs, and ways to engage with um, your regional workforce strategy consultant. And we do have all of the resources from all of our past um, presentations. I just saw somebody write in there if they could get the information. We do email it to everybody who has registered, as well as we post all of that information on this site. Um, you can check out all of that information on careerforcemn.com slash Workforce Wednesday. And you can also sign up to receive any of our emails um, for um, our upcoming events, email, uh, our employer newsletters, and other information about um, what our team is up to. Again, join us on October 2nd to learn more about the MJSP training grant opportunities and um, how they can assist your organization moving forward. And just a quick reminder that October is uh, Manufacturing Month. Uh, the manufacturing industry is a critically important part of Minnesota's diverse economy, contributing to $57.2 billion in our state, which is 12% of the state's economy in 2023. Um, and in making a wide range of products uh, to improve the lives of people around the world, from medical devices to food to recreational vehicles and everything in between. As manufacturing continues to be a staple in our state, Minnesota expects more than 93,000 job openings um, for manufacturing production positions through 2032. So this is a growing and expanding um, industry in our state. So please take a minute to review our resources and upcoming events on careerforcemn.com and download student and job seeker flyers, fillable proclamations, and review in-demand job career uh, opportunities. We have lots of manufacturing tours, school tours, and other events being planned during the month of October. So reach out to one of us on our team uh, for more information. And then finally, we would like to thank all of you for joining us during this main session. Uh, for everyone who registered, we will be sending out the recording and resources from today's session. Uh, feel free to reach out to your workforce strategy consultant in your region with any questions that you may have. And we would love for you to stick around for the Unplugged, which is gonna be starting in just a couple seconds, where you can unmute yourself and turn on your cameras and directly ask your questions to our panelists. And Dina and Brianne, I hope you're ready. We have another 30 minutes um, of asking these questions directly to you. You bet, and Della, it looks like you have an open position. We do, down in our Southern Southeast uh, corner. So yes, great opportunity within the state of Minnesota and within our team. We're a pretty cool team to work with. So um definitely looking for somebody with that hr background um as well as um consultant background and somebody who's a chatterbug just like the rest of us so um 